Okay, okay. now, next thing I'd like to talk about is pre-buy inspections. Yes. Now, what are three things that you have to look out for when you do a pre-buy inspection? What are the three main things you look out for when, you, when you're off to book? And just so for those that are watching, a pre-buy inspection is something that is advisable you have done before you purchase an aircraft. So you have the letter of intent, which will be fired out first. Once you agree on the price, the next thing you need to do or you should do is send out a qualified engineer like Martin to look at all, go, first go through all the maintenance records and then do a physical inspection. Well, as you just alluded to, first of all there, the, um, the key point in anything is that the records match the aircraft. I know it's, it's pretty obvious, but believe it or not, there are a great deal of uh, <laughs> scenarios where the records do not match the aircraft. Okay. Um, exactly. The first so thing mean, I would you do- You mean the records that we were sent and not the records of the airplane you're actually inspecting? Not in their entirety. Some of them, um, you may have two of the three landing gear match the aircraft, and the uh, third is not quite correct. You could have a discrepancy with the serial number. Um, and when you actually go to do the physical inspection on the aircraft, you've actually got a different serialized component. Um, so th the key point that I would always do is review the records first. It's absolutely fundamental, so you get a very good, clear idea. Um, the second part is the AD status. Get a clear understanding as to the... Can you explain um, what AD stands for? The Martin. Airworthiness Directives. These are mandatory maintenance that's dictated by the regulator, the government mm -hmm. organisation to which, the, in which operates and controls the airspace to which the aircraft is registered to operate within. Yeah. Um, you have EASA, you have FAA. EASA, FAA, yeah. Exactly, exactly yeah. Um, so the key point is to understand the authority to which the aircraft is operated and certified. You then pull off your airworthiness directive status list from their specific websites, the regulator's websites, mm -hmm. and then you match that to the status of the aircraft and you make sure that they are all in full compliance and whether they are um, applicable or not. Because again, a lot of operators will have their own um, interpretation of the wording of these ADs. So it's getting a very good, clear visibility as to what these are. Now, mm -hmm. ADs being mandatory maintenance, um, they can be very expensive to embody and lots of operators particularly private jet operators would try and let these things go for as long as they can before they have to spend the money to embody these particular airworthiness directives so again you're looking at the value of these ad's um there's a great deal particularly with um adsb issues uh, fans b plus and all these kind of modifications required uh, to operate aircraft around the world in this particular day and age yeah um Although it's not compliant right now, although there's not requirements for it to be operational right now, yeah. it will add value to your aircraft and what is going to be required to be carried out. So a lot of these are going to be ADs, mm -hmm. um, whether they've been embodied onto the aircraft or not. So you need to have a good clear visibility of this. Uh, there's certain 737 BBJ ADs in the landing gear areas mm -hmm. where um, corrosion behind part of the landing gear electronic module boxes are mounted. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's a lot of serial numbers where this is actually applicable, but gets missed. And to actually do this, you have to jack the aircraft up, you have to take the gear off, you have to remove all the wiring. From a labor perspective, it's very high in costs. To actually perform the AD is very minimal. So is this so, something you would do during a pre-buy inspection or would you look to see that that had been done? I would look to see that it had been done. Yeah. Because okay. if you were going to buy that aircraft, um, I would have, give it to the a very clear visibility to my client that this AD has not been embodied and it will be due imminently and it's going to cost you a lot of money to do it. Yeah, what about boroscopic checks on engine? Could you explain to our viewers what a boroscopic check is? And why it's uh, boroscope inspections are, you have long tubes with little lights at the end of it, which then is connected to a television. Um, and you can either record it through a DVD or through a memory card. And you literally go through the every single blade, every single vein within that engine. Um, of course, with maintenance manual, you can do an entire front to back of the engine. And you can, what would you be looking for during a boroscopic check? Uh, you're looking for damage incurred. You're looking for chipped fan blades. You're looking for cracked fan blades. You're looking for liner inspections to make sure that all the various different liner to the actual casings of the engine are there and complete and there's not only over signs of damage or burning you will get a certain amount of um should we say a uh, frayed material from heat damage um mm -hmm. but that's normal you know yeah. it's understanding the limits to which you're allowed and also understanding the time frames because yeah. you need yeah. to match the limit to the time frames yeah. um 
if you, through experience you can gather, and this is something that I've sort of developed over many years now, mm. is understanding with your utilization, it's flight cycle driven and flight hour driven, although they're two very different um, uh, methods of timing. Yeah. The actual boroscope inspection and wear and tear would mm -hmm. would vary from one to the other. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah. if you're in a low utilized airplane, exactly, exactly. Low utilized aircraft, you're not going to expect a great deal of damage, but you will expect a certain amount and you will get more burning because it's the temperature variations is rapid and short term. Whereas why is a, boroscopic check important then? If you don't do a boroscopic check, what could potentially happen to the airplane if it has a problem? Um, you, your engine will potentially go bang um, and instead of being able to sort of take the engine out fit it put it through shop knowing that this damage is there uh, you can get all of the damage rectified appropriately and at a sensible cost and that's a key point there as well mm, yes. if you don't um, perform a routine boroscope inspection you have no idea of how your engine is degrading so how often do you think and eroding. someone to have a boroscopic check on the engines of the airplane how often do you think one should have that done. Again, it's very much utilization driven. Um, yes, Flying 400 hours a year and, and I would, 200 cycles. I would say certainly part of your, your annual check. Annual check, okay. On a short haul, on a, um, a VIP aeroplane maintenance schedule, I would look for a, a, a very regular boroscope inspection on that annual check. Now, if you're doing a high flight hour utilization program, yeah. then I would increase that frequency. Okay. If you're doing a higher flight cycle um, program, then I would probably do that a lot more frequent. Okay, so the cycles are more important than the hours because that's they are as far as engines. every time you switch the engine on and off, that's a cycle. Yes. Um, and you could, you know, switch it on, fly 10 hours, then switch it off, that's one cycle in 10 hours. Or you could switch it on, fly an hour, land. Yeah. Do a cycle in one the wear and tear. Yeah, yeah. The, the wear and tear on the engine is going to be far more um, impacting in a more greater form on a lower sorry on a higher cycle engine so the more frequently cyclic you dry uh, you have on the engine to a lower time frame such as one to one yeah. then you are going to be needing a lot more boroscope inspections compared to just the annual yeah. and this obviously can prevent accidents from happening engines to you know suddenly blow up or or shut down in flight and things like that it's obviously going to cost you a lot more money so yeah. preventative maintenance is really really key What's, yeah. the, what's the, the other thing you would look for then uh, on, on a pre-buy inspection besides, you know, the records and... Well, every aircraft have their weak points and every specific aircraft has its own unique failings and traditional uh, systemic problems on them. Yeah. Um, again, on an aircraft of a particular utilisation through experience that I've obviously gained through many, many years, again, you would expect a certain amount of systemic failings compared to that time frame. Yeah. If you have an over exaggerated failing um the degradation is far more increased than you would normally expect then that would ring alarm bells yeah. um so you would and you would look for certain things such as uh, weight on the aircraft the amount of fuel that's currently being sat on the airplane how's mm -hmm. that sitting with the uh, pressurization of the landing gear mm -hmm. and the sort of shock absorber yeah. are we looking at sensible uh, sensible lengths sensible depths if not then the aircraft is not being managed in a very good way and it, it it lightens so many values because um, it's going to put additional stresses onto the landing gear mounts. It's going to say that you're, when you're taking off and you're landing, you're exerting too much energy into yeah. those landing gear shock absorbers. Um, and you're going to end up with either gear collapses or seal failures. Yeah, and this uh, is the this really important point that you're, you're, you're saying here is I always say to people, I mean, they spend all this money on buying the aircraft and then they try and go cheap on the maintenance and on the pilots. When, you know, the air plane itself is only one third of the deal then you've got Absolutely. the people that are buying it and you've got the maintenance guys that are maintaining it so yeah. you really need to be careful that you're doing this properly and unfortunately yeah. in private aviation this is not always the case